of the things that make our lives meaningful today had their beginnings several hundred years ago during a period of exploration and inquiry a period populated by creative masters and marked by a renewed appreciation of classical art literature and philosophy a period when old values became linked with new discovery this was the Renaissance The Renaissance began in Italy in the early 14th century. By the time it ended, roughly 300 years later, it had spread throughout Europe. The Renaissance begins in Italy for various reasons, and the list is, is too long to, to cover completely. This is Carlos Air, assistant professor of history, Yale University. One of the major reasons the Renaissance begins in Italy is its political organization and its economy. The fact that the Italian city-states are thriving and, and creating a merchant class and what we might call a middle class that can be educated and can read. And a civilization in which there is enough money left over to produce works of art in great number. There's another reason too, Italy had never disintegrated culturally at the same rate as the rest of Europe. So that therefore uh, you also had right there at hand all of these classical models not just in architecture but also in art and also in terms of the texts that had been preserved. The term Renaissance is a French word that means rebirth. It refers to a period in our history when scholars rediscovered the value of the individual by studying the ideals and artistic expressions of ancient Latin and Greek authors. This movement was called humanism. Humanism is another one of these abstractions like the term renaissance it means many things but as understood in the renaissance studia humanitatis the study of, of human things the study of the culture produced by humans that's simply what it means in its simplest terms something that's often assumed about the renaissance is that this necessarily had to have been a time of peace or of general happiness. Thomas Arnold, assistant professor of history, Yale University. Why else, for example, could someone like, say, Michelangelo have uh, the free time and the incentive to carve a David if it uh, wasn't a happy age? But the truth, more accurately, is that troubling times, trying times, inspire individual human beings to reevaluate and reunderstand and to create anew. And uh, this is true of the Renaissance. To appreciate the importance of humanism to the Renaissance, we first need to look at the thousand years that preceded it. This was a time thought of as a period of cultural darkness, known as the Middle Ages. A period dominated by Christian ideals and where great emphasis was placed on the supremacy of God over human beings in all affairs. The church was very powerful and tolerated little opposition. So rigid was the church that creative thought and new ideas in most fields of study were stifled. The reason that um, during the Renaissance the classical past could be upheld as a model and that people, some people could consider that progress rather than going backwards, is that <clears throat> in their view, their culture that they lived in, which is still enmeshed in, the, in, in what they saw as a dark age, dark culture, they thought everything had sunk to its lowest level and that classical civilization was much higher, so much better, so that returning to that was very much like climbing a peak. Like the Latin and Greek authors they studied, humanists sought the freedom to cultivate the mind 
and explore the world unfettered by church doctrines. They did not reject religion. In fact, many humanists were believers. What they objected to were the harsh rules imposed on them by the church. One of the pioneers of the humanist movement was the Italian poet and scholar Francesco Petrarca, commonly known as Petrarch. Petrarch is an important figure because I think he shows to us the extent to which the new learning, the studia humanitatis, the obsession with the ancient world, could touch a particular individual and could become such a compelling fashion for other intellectuals. He is a Tuscan, but he works in southern France, in Avignon, because he's associated with the papal court, which at that time is in Avignon. So Petrarch carries with him a book of letters which are not actually mailed but which have been composed in what he feels to be the most perfect ancient Latin style. Historians often reach for a particular figure to use as a benchmark or as an example of what a period is all about. With the Renaissance, I think a particularly excellent example is Lorenzo Valla. So Lorenzo Valla, this trained humanist, works for the King of Naples, who is at loggerheads with the Pope in Rome, disputing their authority. The Pope in Rome based part of his authority on a document known as the Donation of Constantine, which was supposed to have granted to the Pope by the Emperor Constantine in the 4th century AD all sorts of powers. Uh, medieval popes ruled over most of central Italy and, and based their secular authority over this whole region of Italy on the donation of Constantine. Well, Valla studied this text and proved convincingly by studying the syntax and the grammar that this could not be from the fourth century. That in fact you don't find anyone in the fourth century writing Latin like this. And proved that the donation of Constantine was a forgery from several centuries later. Lorenzo Valla never backed away from controversy. In the mid-1400s, he again took on the church when he applied his humanist study of linguistics to the sacred text of Dionysius the Areopagite, a man said to be converted by the Apostle Paul. The largest number of quotes in medieval theology, of course, come from the Bible itself. Second to that, St. Augustine. And third, in third place, Dionysius the Areopagite. He was a great authority. Well, Lorenzo Valla proved that Dionysius could not have lived in the first century. That all of these texts were written by someone who lived much, much later. By studying the texts and studying the syntax, the grammar, the style, the form of expression, he proved convincingly that Dionysius was from much later, and this came as a great shock to many people. Several factors contributed to the spread of humanism throughout northern Italy, and eventually the rest of Europe. One was the invention of the printing press. Education requires using resources that would otherwise have to be used for producing food and, and, and for mere survival. The more prosperous and complex an economy becomes, the higher the number of people who can be taught to read and become educated. So you have the happy coincidence that as, as this segment of the population is increasing, people who can afford an education and can learn to read coincides with the invention of the printing press. Uh, which makes it possible to spread ideas much more quickly. And maybe it's not entirely a coincidence. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. Prior to the Renaissance, books were produced by hand, usually by monks or paid copyists. Each volume was painstakingly copied and bound. They were usually large and bulky and expensive. Generally speaking, people of the upper classes were the only ones who could afford them and the most likely to know how to read. All this changed around the year 1450 when German-born Johannes Gutenberg 
invented the printing press and movable metal type. Now books could be produced more easily. They were also smaller in size and inexpensive. For the first time in history, most people had access to books. In 1454, Gutenberg printed the 42-line Bible. It was the first book printed with his invention. Why does the printing press arise in Europe and not in China, where it was really invented? Movable type is invented in Germany around 1450 um, because Johannes Gutenberg realizes that there's a market for this. But there are people who will buy books and he can produce them by the hundreds, not realizing that very quickly after that they can be produced by the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. As interest in reading grew, so did the desire for schooling. This ignited a boom in school construction throughout Renaissance Europe. And this again shows why there is perhaps an association of increased literacy at the end of the Middle Ages, in the early Renaissance, in Italy, because here is where you see the most flourishing, in general, urban communities who have the merchants and the money changers, uh, the bankers, who need to be able to keep books and keep books properly. They need clerks, and clerks need to be able to read and write. So in a city like Florence, by the early 14th century, there is a demand for people who can read, a demand for people who can write, and uh, that demand is being served by schools and quite ordinary people. During the Italian Renaissance, many wealthy families rose to power over the cities and promoted humanism through the patronage of writers, artists, and scholars. Of these families, the wealthiest and most influential were the Medicis of Florence, who amassed their fortune in commerce and banking. Cosimo de' Medici came to power in 1434. He built the first public library and filled it with thousands of ancient manuscripts. Many of these works were originals unearthed by Greek and Egyptian agents employed by Cosimo. Then, in 1469, Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo de' Medici, came to power. Lorenzo had a humanist disposition and was by far the most generous patron of all Renaissance princes. And Florence, uh, of all Italian cities, uh, is in many ways the undisputed leader in the Renaissance. And it's thanks to the Medicis, largely, that this is so, because the Medicis were great patrons of art and learning. And uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, in particular, um, sponsored artists, sponsored scholars, and made the Renaissance possible on, on several levels. Lorenzo himself was a man of learning who felt equally at home in both political and philosophical arenas. Under his leadership, the Platonic Academy flourished. Its mission was to find philosophical agreement between humanistic thought and Christianity. The head of the Academy was the Italian philosopher and linguist Marsilio Ficino. The Middle Ages, especially the second half of the Middle Ages, um, thinking was dominated by Aristotle, varying degrees, depending on time and place. But Aristotle had reigned supreme for much of the second half of the Middle Ages. And now, in the 16th century, Marsilio Ficino opens his Platonic Academy in Florence, and the study of Plato is renewed. As the humanist movement gained momentum in Renaissance Italy, it wasn't long before it spread north beyond the Alps to all parts of Europe. To understand why the Renaissance moves out of Italy to be so influential elsewhere in Europe, we, we have to understand the place of Italy in reference to the rest of Europe at this time. Italy is one of the most developed, most prosperous, most urban parts of Europe. If you compare, say, the Kingdom of England and the territory of Italy 
in the 15th, 16th century. There is only one city of note in England at this time, London. There are a dozen cities of note, uh, places of a population of more than 10,000 or more in the peninsula of Italy. This is simply the place where uh, trade is concentrated and where intellectual life is concentrated and where also much of cultural life is concentrated. So it's not surprising that the fashion in Italy, in intellectual affairs, this embracing of the humanistic curriculum, this emphasis on the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks as the model for everything, it's not surprising that once this becomes popular in Italy, this spreads elsewhere in Europe because Europeans are in the habit of looking to Italy for leadership in fashion, whether that is in dress or whether that is in cultural affairs. On October the 27th, 1466, a man was born in the Netherlands who had become the most influential scholar of Northern Renaissance. His name was Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus began his adult life as an Augustinian monk, but neither satisfied nor inspired by his work, he left the monastery to travel Europe in order to study and teach. Erasmus spent his life advancing the revival of Greek and Latin literature. What makes the Renaissance different from the Middle Ages is that in fact there were people who stopped thinking of it as a problem and started thinking of it as a virtue. Um, Saint Jerome, the Christian scholar who translated the Bible into Latin in the fourth century, is a good example of this conflict as, as felt by Christians in the Middle Ages. Jerome had, of course, studied all the classical texts and loved Cicero especially. And there he was hard at work translating the Bible into Latin. Now later, European Christians, Western European think, uh, Christians would think that Jerome's translation was directly inspired by God and was therefore sacred. And there was no error at all in his translation. Erasmus was one of the many who criticized church officials for being more interested in secular politics and lavish living than in serving the spiritual needs of the congregation. The reformation of the church and Renaissance thinking was undeniably linked. Whereas Erasmus wanted to correct the church from within, others led by German priest and scholar Martin Luther demanded more radical solutions. Unlike earlier reformers who criticized the habits of the church and its officials, he attacked church doctrine. Eventually, Luther's clash with the Catholic Church would lead to his excommunication. By then, his actions and writings triggered the Protestant Reformation. Soon, other humanists broke away from the Catholic Church. They included the Frenchman John Calvin, the Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli, and King Henry VIII. As the split between the Catholics and Protestants widened, what began as an ideological warfare erupted into violence and persecution. The Thirty Years' War, though not entirely a religious war, is often cited as the culmination of a period of religious warfare. I once saw a map of the, the casualties caused by the Thirty Years' War, a map of Germany. There are parts of Germany in this map which were identified as having 60% casualties as a result of the Thirty Years' War. Thirty Years' War is not entirely a religious war, but it's, it's often cited as, as the culmination of a period of religious warfare. There's no denying the fact that disagreements about religion which are, are present in the Middle Ages, but are intensified various reasons, but especially by the invention of the printing press in the 16th century, that, that religious disagreements lead to violence all over Europe. During the Inquisition, Catholics and Protestants alike persecuted heretics and those thought to be possessed by the devil. 
In those days, that could mean almost anyone who wasn't a Christian. And so trials are arranged. And the unfortunate truth is that all trials in this period, the Renaissance, Middle Ages, are by our current standards brutal affairs. It was broadly assumed that people spoke more truthfully when they were under the torture. So in all sorts of procedures, not just against heresy, not just against witches, the accused are put to the torture. And this was believed to get a more truthful response out of them. So the brutality that we perhaps associate with the witch trials was also part of normal judicial procedure. Violence of all sorts is linked to religion in the 16th and especially in the 17th century. And um, it, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that in fact by the time you get to Voltaire in the 18th century, one of the reasons that he and, and those around him despise the Christian religion is that as they see it, it has caused nothing but trouble, nothing but intolerance and bigotry and violence. The French historian John de Lumo argued that throughout the medieval period, Europeans were only thinly Christianized. That if you scratched the surface of their Christian beliefs and practices, what you found underneath was a vast ocean of pagan pre-Christian beliefs. There is a fascinating anecdote of a 16th century Jesuit who remarks, why go to India to look for pagans when you can find them right here in Italy? That you can travel to the other side of the world and find people who need conversion to the true message of Christ. But you can also go to plenty of districts in southern Italy and find people who are essentially equally ignorant of the message of the Gospels. As the Reformation signaled the end of the Christian-dominated view of the world, it ushered in a new age of discovery. New and dynamic thinkers brought great advances to all areas of life. Take commerce, for instance, where many fortunes were made in trading, manufacturing, and banking. Venice is a prime example. By the 15th century, between her huge trading empire and a fleet of ships, Venice became the richest city in Europe. To protect their trading interests, cities like Venice united to form regional trading alliances. The German Hanseatic League was one such alliance. The Hanseatic League protected the trading interests of northern German towns in the Baltic Sea. It was also responsible for protecting its trade ships from pirates, promoting safe navigation by building lighthouses, and establishing commercial bases overseas. Another contribution of the Renaissance to modern industry was job specialization. In Venice, it was the manufacturing of glassware and shipbuilding. Another of today's businesses that owes its existence to the Renaissance is the banking industry. As the trade between foreign countries mushroomed, so did the exchange of foreign currencies. Banks kept track of the relative rates of exchange and turned a profit through buying and selling these currencies. The most important bankers during the early part of the Renaissance were Italian financiers, commonly known as the Lombard bankers, centered in Florence. The Italian gold coin, the Florin, was accepted throughout Europe and the Near East. The 15th century saw wealthy merchants establishing banking institutions in other countries as well. In Germany, the Fugers of Augsburg were one of the more successful. Later, under the supervision of Jacob Fuger, his family moved from selling trade goods into banking and built a vast financial empire that stretched across the seas and included interests in mining, trading and manufacturing. As commerce evolved and modernized, so did the political landscape. Sir Thomas More, for one, was the chief administrator for Henry VIII. One of the most controversial political theorists was the Italian statesman Niccolo Machiavelli. In his book, The Prince, he extols the virtues of tyranny the rulers must use to maintain power. 
Machiavelli supports a republic, some scholars believe the prince was a satire. Others argue that Machiavelli was merely describing the political reality of the day. Machiavelli is a fascinating figure in part because his literature was essentially accidental. He was an official of the Florentine Republic. He was an important diplomat. He made important diplomatic missions for the Republic of Florence, representing them in Rome and in France as well as elsewhere. Uh, he was therefore a man with real knowledge and real access to the real politics of the Renaissance in the very late 15th century and early 16th century. But he loses his job when the Florentine Republic collapses. The advice he gives is probably not terribly different from the advice that any top official in the political world would give to a prince or to a ruling state at this time. And it is the happenstance of Machiavelli's desperation for a job at a particular moment which causes Machiavelli to be the man that we associate with Renaissance politics rather than any of several dozen or hundred men, contemporaries of Machiavelli, who were also assisting in administering the affairs of state, um, the Italian principalities and republics. The period of the Renaissance is also uh, the period of exploration for Europeans, exploration and, and colonization. They coincide and it's no accident. One of the factors that makes the Renaissance possible, as I said before, is the improvement of the European economy. And that improved economy uh, was made possible by an expansion of trade. Trade was expanding. The reason that Europeans turn into great explorers is that they are looking always to expand their markets and to obtain goods which they know will sell that have a market in Europe. So they're, they're seeking to get to Asia because there are so many goods in Asia that will sell in European markets, especially spices and textiles, especially silk. At the onset of the Renaissance, people thought the world was flat. This changed in the 14th century when the writings of the ancient geographer Ptolemy were recovered. In them, he proposed that the earth was round and that a ship could reach India not by sailing east, but by sailing westward. Queen Isabella of Castile gives Columbus the funds to make his crazy trip, to go west instead of east because he tells her the world is round. There you have an aspect of the Renaissance coming into play in exploration. The idea that the world is round rather than flat. It's an idea that the ancient Romans uh, had accepted. During the Middle Ages, it had been kind of forgotten or ignored. To argue that one can get to China by sailing west rather than east. And having a monarch believe that and give you the money to make the trip requires that kind of cultural change that was brought about by the Renaissance. One field of study captured the spirit of the Renaissance more than any other, art. Freed from the church's grip, artists found the study of nature and the human anatomy more interesting than the religious symbolism. They explored values like grace and beauty found in nature, and they experimented with new techniques. The center of this revival in art was Florence, but it flourished in many other Italian cities. So these cities, uh, Venice, uh, Florence, Milan, Genoa, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Naples even in the south of Italy, these cities are centers of economic uh, production and from that success you have the raw material, you have the cash that can pay for the artists, that can pay for the architects and that can be indulged as one family exerts its uh, ambition over and against another family by endowing a chapel or by paying for a picture to be painted and so we see a direct connection between the material prosperity of Italy and its cultural aggressiveness even. 
The early Renaissance in Italy was a time of great experimentation. No one artistic style dominated the period. The results were a number of innovations that paved the way for modern art. One of the greatest naturalist sculptors of the Renaissance was Donato de Beto di Bardi, better known as Donatello. Donatello worked in both marble and bronze. His bronze rendering of David was the first freestanding nude statue of the Renaissance. Another great innovation in Renaissance art came from north of the Alps, where Dutch painter Jan Hubert van Eyck perfected the technique of oil painting. The artistic experiments of the 13th and 14th centuries paved the way for a style of painting called High Renaissance. It was a style characterized by the use of mathematics to achieve harmony and balance, and it dominated the artistic landscape at the end of the 15th century and into the 16th. Two of the greatest High Renaissance artists were Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. The great artists Leonardo da Vinci, probably the most famous, who lived uh, the 15th and 16th century. The true Renaissance man, who tried to do just about everything, and did everything very well. Painter, sculptor, scientist, thinker, inventor. But there are many other figures uh, whose names are not household words who achieved um, success at their craft, the same level as Leonardo. The other artist who is perhaps uh, best known is Michelangelo, who lived in the 16th century and was sculptor and a painter. <laughs> dazzled everyone around him. Everyone recognized him as a genius. With reason. With reason. Uh, and even the popes sought out Michelangelo um, for the building of St. Peter's in Rome, for the decoration of the Sistine Chapel. During the Renaissance, experimentation was also going on in music. Innovative, complex, polyphonic compositions, replacing single melodic works that characterize music of the Middle Ages. In order to play this modern music, new, sophisticated instruments like the violin and harpsichord were invented. Several composers gained fame during the Renaissance. Among them, the Frenchman, Guillaume de Fay, who was noted for his church music and chansons, who were popular songs that dealt with themes like love and sadness. Rome was home to the famous Italian composer, Giovanni Perugia de Palestrina. His musical output, which included both church and secular works, numbered over 500 pieces. Another important Renaissance composer was Vincenzo Galilei, father of the astronomer Galileo. He was known mostly for his books on music theory. Vincenzo often wrote music in what was then considered an ancient Greek style. Parallel to the development of the fine arts were advancements made in the literary world. Renaissance writers experimented with new forms of poetry and prose. 
they also discovered that their words had the power to change the way people thought. This was aided by the increasing popularity of works written in an author's native language or vernacular. The relationship between Latin and the vernacular language is one of the more interesting facets of the Renaissance. It's surprising perhaps to learn, but many intellectuals through the early Renaissance supposed that there had always been two languages at work in European culture that there had always been a Latin, which was the language of the aristocrats and of the intellectuals, and there had always been an Italian or some other similar language that was spoken by the peasants and the little folk. And it is only in the time of the Renaissance, really from the late 15th century on, that there is an understanding that modern day languages, such as Italian, are in fact evolutionary growth of a Latin language. The first great vernacular writer came at the dawn of the Renaissance in Florence. Dante Alighieri was an Italian poet and prose writer, a moral philosopher and political thinker. His masterpiece was his epic poem, La Divina Commedia, The Divine Comedy. By writing in Italian rather than Latin, Dante laid the course for all future literary advancements. Another Florentine author who gave rise to the field of literature was Francesco Petrarch. Besides his numerous works written in Latin, Petrarch was also known for his Italian sonnets. One of Petrarch's protégés was the great Italian writer Giovanni Boccaccio. Like Dante and Petrarch, Boccaccio was a humanist who spirited the revival of classical texts Though he wrote many Latin works, he is best known for his collection of witty stories written in Italian called the Decameron. Boccaccio raised the standards by which vernacular works were judged, and for all this he was named father of Italian prose. The first great English writer to write in the vernacular was the outstanding poet Geoffrey Chaucer. Though he held government posts under three kings, Chaucer's best contributions came with his talents for writing poetry. Many of his writings speak of love on a human as well as spiritual level. He's best known for The Canterbury Tales, which for many is one of the finest epic poems written in English. The French vernacular movement was led by the humanist and priest Francois Rabelais. He's remembered for his comic masterpiece, Gargantua and Pantagruel, a series of four books written in Renaissance French. In then, Rabelais mocked all aspects of French and European society with a humorous flair that ranged from burlesque to satire. One of the most famous Spanish vernacular Renaissance writers was Miguel de Cervantes. Born in poverty with little formal education, Cervantes didn't begin writing until his late fifties. His first works captured little attention, but that changed when he wrote a novel about the humorous adventures of an old, idealistic Spanish aristocrat who thought he was a medieval knight. It was called Don Quixote. First published in 1615, this classic continues to be read worldwide today. The Broadway play Man of La Mancha is based on his book. 16th century England bore many literary greats. Freed from the strictures of the church, their writings gained more power, more life, and more respect. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the English theatre, where playwrights like William Shakespeare entertained Elizabethan audiences. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford-upon-Avon in 1564. He moved to London where he joined a theatre company that performed his plays at the famous Globe Theatre. Four centuries later, his poems, sonnets and plays are celebrated worldwide. It's interesting to note how much of his work, especially his plays, were influenced by Italy. So Shakespeare looks to Italy for the scenery of some of his more important plays, some of his more successful plays, such as The Merchant of Venice, such as Othello, such as Romeo and Juliet. To that extent, it's stage setting, it's scenery, but it's also referencing the fact that Shakespeare himself is looking to Italy 
to the culture of Italy for not just the scenery, not just the background, but also the meat of the matter. When Shakespeare's villains operate the way they do, we see in that a certain reference perhaps to Machiavelli, who of course would be known in Italy by the end, known in England by the end of the 16th century, and would be in fact sometimes uh, impugned as a dangerous influence on politics, but nonetheless would be a well-known figure. So it's not surprising that Shakespeare, when he wants to paint a villain a particular way, he makes that villain an Italian, or places him in an Italian context, because contemporary Englishmen knew that Italy was a place where particular political skullduggery took place. One of the greatest poets of the Renaissance was the Elizabethan statesman and soldier, Sir Philip Sidney. He was a Renaissance theorist who defended his critical ideas in his book, The Defense of Poetry. Among his sonnets, Sir Sidney's Astrophel and Stella is considered by many one of the finest. Among Renaissance essayists, one of the most noted was the Lord Chancellor of England, Sir Francis Bacon. A master speaker and intellectual, his essays reflected his insight on such worldly matters as life, death, truth and marriage. He also advocated the study of emerging sciences. The same creative spirit that changed Renaissance art and literature also sparked revolution in scientific investigation. Unlike the Middle Ages, where beliefs were founded on astrology and magic, Renaissance scientists supported their discoveries through observation and experimentation. Sir Francis Bacon argued this innovative scientific method in his book, Advancement of Learning. Renaissance scientists literally changed the way the human race viewed the universe. It wasn't until Polish astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus came along that Western civilization accepted the fact that the Sun was the center of the cosmos and not the Earth. Copernicus also observed that the Earth spun around on its own axis every 24 hours. He compiled his theories in his book, Six Books Concerning the Revolutions of the Heavenly Orbs, published the year of his death. Tycho Bray added to Copernicus's work by measuring the positions of the stars and planets more accurately than anyone before him. And in Germany, Johannes Kepler concluded that the planets did not revolve around the Sun in circles, but in ellipses. Kepler gave us the first working model of our solar system. The Italian philosopher, astronomer and mathematician Galileo Galilei was among the first scientists to study the heavens using a telescope. With this new invention, he attacked problems of motion and astronomy. He also showed that there were mountains on the moon and satellites orbiting Jupiter. Galileo's observations confirmed Copernicus's theories about the Sun being the center of the universe. And for this, he was branded a heretic by the church. He was brought before an inquisition and forced to reject all his discoveries or else be put to death. He spent his last years under house arrest. The Roman Catholic Church had one institution, the Inquisition, which in um, Anglo-American scholarship has always been painted in very, very dark terms as intolerant and extremely cruel. What recent scholarship has uncovered is that the Inquisition run in places like Spain, Rome, other places in Italy, was no more intolerant or cruel than similar institutions set up by Protestant churches places like Geneva, for instance. Long after Bray, Kepler and Galileo died, scientists were still struggling with questions about motion. If the Earth spins on its axis, why don't we fall off the Earth? What makes it possible for the Earth to remain suspended in space? And how does the Earth move around the Sun? It wasn't until Isaac Newton discovered the laws of gravity and motion that these questions were finally answered. In 1687, he published his findings in his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. 
Newton was a mathematical genius. He was also very religious. He believed that the forces of the universe did not operate without God's help. The Renaissance also saw advancements in medicine. People slowly began to turn from superstition and magic for cures and look for alternative treatments. The plague comes to Europe, but it does not immediately leave. It stays in Europe and becomes an endemic through, in Italy at least, the early 17th century. So if the plague disrupts a district, it will return again and disrupt that same district a decade later or a half generation later. So to live and work in Renaissance world was to know that there was always the possibility of calamity. Around 1590, the microscope was invented. This invention helped establish for the first time the connections between germs, hygiene, and diseases. Philippus von Honeheim, known as Parcellus, was a German-Swiss physician whose work proved the link between chemistry and medicine. One of his findings came in 1530 when he discovered that mercury compounds are an effective antidote for syphilis. Probably the biggest contribution to Renaissance medicine was the work done by Andreas Vesalius on the study of the human anatomy. He was the first to dissect cadavers as opposed to animals, which was the accepted practice of the time. His major work, The Seven Books on the Structure of the Human Body, was published in 1543. Other inventions and developments of the Renaissance that we take for granted today are the mechanical clock, the compass, the microscope, even the calculator, which was preceded by the abacus. It's hard to imagine living the lifestyle we enjoy today without the Renaissance. It was a period that stirred the imagination of geniuses and the ambitions of modern men by looking back to ancient times for ways of making the future better. The next time you log onto the internet or simply check the time or read a book, remember that it all started in an age we call the Renaissance.